then without further ado i want to start uh, today's webinar it's one minute past one and uh, central european summertime and uh, it's uh, great uh, to have um, dave white with us uh, for the first topic of the uh, first webinar for topic one and um, kicking off the um, spotlight versus pin yeah thank you i got the uh, tip here and uh, um, that uh, i was supposed to be doing spotlighting um spotlight for everyone and uh, more no I, can i spotlight myself i try to do this uh, at spotlight yes uh, now we're talking i think uh, anyway um Digital literacy is digital participation. Um, a little bit rusty here on my end. Jörg Pareikis is my name. Um, you might have seen myself in the uh, course uh, introduction. Um, but today, um, we are happy to have uh, Dave White with us. Uh, Dave is uh, has been with us for numerous sessions now and um, is um, the head of the Digital Education and Academic Practice at the University of Arts in London and is also the president of the Association for Learning Technology uh, in, uh, in the UK. And for those of you who are not uh, familiar with uh, ALT, um, it, ALT is the um, leading professional body for learning technology in the UK and uh, one of the top organizations internationally, I'd say, uh, if you are interested in learning technology. So pleasure to have you with us, Dave. Thank it you, is. everyone, for being so uh, flexible. And um, sorry about the last minute changes, but great to see so many uh, of you here today. Dave? Cheers. You're, yeah, the last minute change. Absolutely. That's on me, not on York. That's there's a lot going on here. And it all got a bit it all got a bit crazy. Um, <clears throat> so brilliant to see so many people. What we're going to do, we've got we've got just under an hour. Uh, and there's a couple of activities in this session, uh, but I will flag those so that you know the bits that you actually have to pay attention to. Um, we're going to be covering, yeah, kind of online engagement, digital literacy. Um, and I had a little look around kind of some of your blog posts already. Uh, it's great to see people engaging uh, and, and so keen. And also just an interesting vibe, because I think so many of us have been online so much that there seems to be a new level of, I don't know what to say, a, a kind of more confidence just in operating like this. Seems, I mean, this is now normal and being in buildings isn't, but it's interesting to see that reflected in the course as well, I think. Um, so I'm just gonna find my way to my slides. I'm reasonably hopeful you can all see these. Would that be the case? Yeah. Yay! Okay, so. so, so. Oh, sorry, Dave. I pressed the wrong button here. I wanted to mute someone else. Uh, muted you, unfortunately. That's all right. You, you muted me. That's fine. I, I that that's a get that sends me a good signal at the start. Uh, of the session. Really sorry about that. I once I once did quite a big session that was in Microsoft Teams, and once it had started, I thought I'd better switch off all the other things on my desktop, and immediately switched off Microsoft Teams because I forgot it was in Microsoft Teams and disappeared from the session just like that. So you know, so this. Uh, is from Kevin Kelly, who you could call a futurist. Note the date, 1997. He's actually one of the few people that I would rate in terms of having kind of predicted the future. And this idea, you can ask the question, what's specific to the internet, the web, that hasn't come before in, a, in, in any other sense, really? So what's distinct about it? And I'd say there were, for me, there are two major things. There's this point here, suddenly everything's connected to everything else. And then the effect of that, which is the second point, is it means that anybody can publish, anybody can contribute. So we're suddenly living in this hyper-networked environment and that has massive implications, not least of which for teaching and learning, what it means to know, and you know all elements of society now, um, it wasn't that long ago that the internet was a strange place that only a few people dealt with. Now it's on the agenda of governments, it's affecting democracy. It's just, it is through everything. Um, it's where we get on with our lives. And I'd say where we get on with society as well. Now I come from a, a really big um, art and design focused university 
And uh, about this time last year, I made this little, I think it's like a seven minute video, just reflecting on the pandemic and what that meant for what I call a desituated art school, which is basically, and I think it's a question we've all been asking, which is what does it mean to be a university and education provider that has little or no access to buildings? So I was, you know, that's very Googleable because the word desituated is, is quite a, a strange word. And so that comes straight up as a YouTube video. So if you want to learn a little bit more about my context, then, then that's worth looking at. In terms of this session, Oh, and what I should say is do, uh, I welcome you to, I'll just open it, I welcome you to uh, make comments, discuss, ask questions in the chat as we go along. I'll keep an eye on it, okay? Um, and if I don't respond in the moment, then we can come back around to some of the questions, hopefully. But first of all, let's have a, let's stand back and think about the internet uh, as a, oh, look at that, I waved my arms and the lights came on. Thanks, sensor. Um, so, the, one of the really interesting things, and I think it's something that we still struggle to grapple with, is that the internet is virtual in many senses. It's like an imagined space. And we all have our own map of it in our heads, our own way of kind of navigating it, deciding where things are and what's important and what's connected to what. We don't really have a shared map. You know, there's no real shared language. If you think about a physical city, then I think there's much more shared language around the kind of geography of that space and how you navigate it. But online, there aren't really any maps. There's just search engines. So this is something that Kevin Kelly did as well. Um, as you can tell, I'm a bit of a fan. And it was very simple. It was just, please draw a map of the internet as you see it and indicate, indicate your home. And it came up with really, really interesting results. So here's one from somebody who's 12. This is what I think of as the kind of physical infrastructure of the internet. There's lots of computers connected together and then their laptop on the Wi-Fi. And then this is the kind of more swirly. It's a bit like how I think of it, just swirly with little boxes, whether they're particular websites, I don't know, or particular apps. And there's a little red one down at the bottom left, which might be their home. Um, but again, sure. An interesting interpretation. This one's fun. I, I interpret this as a kind of informational way of thinking about uh, yes, the web. Yeah. So you've got, it's almost like it's the internet's piping a huge amount of stuff through maybe their computer and out the other side, you know, kind of knowledge or information based. And then the last one I'll show you, you can find these on Flickr, is what I'd call like the human centered uh, image of the web, which I think is actually where a lot of people, how a lot of people conceptualize the internet and the web these days, um, which is that actually it's not conceptualized as a technology. It's thought of as the people that they connect with, if you see what I mean. So the technology has become disintermediated. It's a bit more transparent. We, I mean, as in a way, the term technology is, is really a description we give to things we don't understand or that we consider to be broken. As soon as uh, we, uh, become uh, fluent with the technology, the technology itself tends to disappear. And the thing that we're trying to achieve is what we think about, okay? Um, so for many people, the web is other people. For some people, it's a lot of technology and for a lot of people, it's some sort of combination. But the point is all of those are correct. They're not, there's no, th those are all correct interpretations, but they're all different. So what we're going to do in a second is a kind of mapping exercise to, to get a kind of shared sense of what's going on. Um, but first of all, I just want to give it a little bit of background. I find this diagram quite useful um, in terms of digital literacy. What I tend to talk about tends to be up at the top of the triangle. So I tend to talk about practices and identity. But I just want to make the point that access and awareness and skills are fundamental. Otherwise, you don't get to practice an identity. Now, as with any of these diagrams, I don't see them as a ladder that you climb up bit by bit. In actual fact, you're constantly looping around. It's an iterative pro process. You're constantly looping around this. But obviously, the concept, you know, literacy takes place across all of these things, which I think is worth noting. You know, technical skill is only one aspect of it. And eventually it starts becoming about practices and identities. You know, who am I? Who am I becoming? What do I want to be? what knowledge am I kind of ontologically becoming part of? 
And as we know with, well, I think this is a very famous idea that comes from around about 2001, Digital Natives. And this was proposed by Mark Prensky as a way of coming to understand how we engage with technology. Now, at the time he was talking about gaming, this is well pre-social media, but he, he, was, he was trying to find a way of sort of describing what was happening with this sudden influx of, influx of digital technology everywhere. Um, so what I'm gonna do now, just because rather than just talk through it, um, what I'm gonna do is put a whiteboard up and I'd like everybody to answer for themselves what they think digital, the term digital native means. Now I've not used this whiteboard before, so this is a bit exciting, but we'll give it a go. Right, there's a whiteboard. I suspect everybody can see it and everybody can draw on it. Um, you might wanna choose the text function, you might wanna draw freehand, but what, when I, if I said digital natives, how would you describe what that means? What's the definition of a digital native? You might need to click view options and then say annotate. Um, okay, exciting. Uh, view options. Where would they be? Um, on the on the top of uh, everyone's screen should be you are viewing David White's screen and next to it is view options. And there you can find the uh, menu option annotate and then you can choose between text. Ah, and... Some people are finding it. Yeah. 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 Yeah, comfortable and confident. Born into the digital world, yeah. They don't exist. Okay, yeah, we'll get to that. <laughs> um, okay, I see there's, there are some skeptics. Born with touch screen, that's interesting, yeah. I have this theory that, that there's, this, there's this very, very tiny little slice of people that had phones, but they weren't smartphones and they did all their socializing by texting. So my eldest son's in that generation. It's about two, three years long. And I think they're a very particular set of people technologically. Okay, born in the digital era. Someone who's, who's resident. Great, I'll just give it sort of 30 more seconds. Not as native as we think, right. So you see, I've got, I've still got Teams on and it's blipping me messages, but I don't dare switch it off just in case. <laughs> just don't switch anything off. Good at using desktop software. And again, people who are born in the digital era. Thank you for that. If you didn't get a chance to get your answer down, don't worry. Um, what I'm gonna do is get rid of the whiteboard now. At least I think I am. No, I didn't manage that. Let's go back to my slides. Exciting, isn't it? Now, hopefully you can see my slides again. Oh, look at that. And it's, <laughs> it's still overlaid. Okay, so yeah, absolutely. I don't think there's any right answer to that. I think there's some real, um, there's a little bit of skepticism in the room. Um, but I think broadly speaking, the idea is it's people that were born into, you know, born with digital technology already being around them. And the theory there would be that if you, if you grow up with digital technologies, then you are native to them. But the actual metaphor, when you look at it, was one of language. So it's almost like you use digital technology as if you were speaking your first language. Whereas if you're an adult, when the digital technologies come along, then perhaps you get really good at those technologies, but it's always like speaking an additional language. So I think fluency is probably the most useful concept hiding in here. But of course, the problem was that it quickly came, the digital natives and digital immigrants idea quickly came to be understood as old people don't understand technology and young people understand it really well. And what that meant was for there's about 15 years worth of educational establishments, not really helping students with digital capabilities, digital fluencies, digital literacies, whatever you want to call them, because the assumption was because their phones and laptops were slightly shinier than the ones that the teaching staff had, they must be really good with technology. Fundamentally, I think, as most of you might agree, being good with technology is not the same as being good at learning or at studying or at any given practice. Um, 
in the simplest possible terms, having 20,000 followers on Instagram doesn't make you a brilliant researcher. Why would we imagine that? So you, I think what happens is we confuse, I don't know how to get rid of the whiteboard now. <laughs> Any ideas you want? I mean, look, here we go. We confuse ownership with capability. Uh, what you can see is I own a really nice laptop, but I have no idea how to work that whiteboard. But what I do know how to do is to run an interactive online session. So there's lots of practices kind of interwoven there. So we confuse ownership with capability, or we used to. You know, if, if people owned really fancy looking technology, we thought they were capable with them. Um, and this is some research we did at my institution a while back, and I, I'm not going to go through it in detail, just to say that I think the key one in here is 25% of students were mildly anxious and didn't feel ready to share their work online. So you might be brilliant with technology, but it doesn't mean you want to share your work in progress that you're doing within your studies. And I think we all feel that, right? I could see that from some of your blog posts, um, that it's quite... The interesting thing about this course is it puts you in the same position as a lot of as, as we put a lot of students, which is you kind of get dropped into it, and then you're almost deliberately doesn't explain that much because that's the philosophy of the course, and you have to and the part of the learning is negotiating how you're going to learn on what basis, what the focus is going to be, <clears throat> and. You know, I think it wouldn't matter if you were a genius at WordPress. Writing your first blog post on that basis is something that you really have to think about, and it might make you feel a bit nervous. But I think you know, any good, any any usually any good learning environment makes you feel slightly nervous, but like good nervous. Okay, I'm going to introduce this digital mapping process. I happen to know that somebody's already done it in rather an elegant manner. We'll come back around to that because that's the subject of their first blog post. But I think for most of you, you won't have done this process necessarily directly. Um, but even if you've done it before, it doesn't do any harm doing it again because things change. So this is part of a mapping workshop that's based on the visitor residence idea. What I'm going to do is briefly explain the visitor and residence idea and then the mapping process. And then I'm gonna ask you to do your maps and upload them to a Padlet. <clears throat> so if you've got a pen and paper handy, if you wanna do it kind of analog, cause that works. And then you can take a photograph on a smartphone and upload it to a Padlet, or you can do it digitally and upload anyway. But that's where we're headed over the next kind of 15, 20 minutes. Um, I've, done, I've done this, This I basically I came up with the idea and came up with the mapping process along with uh, colleagues and um, then just put it out there kind of under open licenses. So people pick this process up and do it all over the world. Um, so what I'm gonna do is rather than, it's a continuum and it's about modes of engagement. Um, it's not about trying to type people. And I think that's possibly the down, that's one of the downsides of the digital natives and digital immigrants idea is that it, it tries to type people. What we're doing here is looking at a continuum of different ways of engaging. We're not trying to define a person, if you like. Some people might uh, engage more often in a resident mode. Some people might engage more often in a visitor mode. It sort of doesn't make them a resident or a visitor. It's just what they're up to, right? I mean, there's probably some really heavy philosophy we could get into on that. Um, but the, the key thing is to, is to see it as a sliding scale. Now, what I'm going to do is, even though I've said that it's not about one thing or the other, and certainly visitor mode is not better or worse than resident mode or the other way around, I am going to explain the either end of the continuum, just because it's an easy way of explaining the idea, and then that tees us up to do the mapping exercise. So when you're in visitor mode, the easiest way to explain it is to say, you're really, you're trying to get a job done you see the web like a sort of untidy toolbox, maybe. You rummage around and find the tool that's going to work for you. You do the thing that you want to do. It's instrumental. You've decided you've got a thing to do. And then once you've done it, you kind of put that tool back and close the box. Now, a few years ago, you might have logged off, but I don't think anybody logs off now. I think occasionally we don't look at screens, but we don't log off. Um, a few years ago, we did some research and, and one student, we asked, one of the questions was, how long do you spend online each day? 
And the student said, well, sometimes I'm asleep, but my phone is still on. Does that count? <laughs> and if you think about, I mean, you think about these smartwatches, like I've got a fairly stupid smartwatch here. Uh, they're beginning to advertise, you know, monitoring your sleep patterns. So I just think like, it's not really about whether you're logged on, it's about attention. It's about your attention and what you're paying attention to. So examples would include, I've got a little list there, you know, searching for stuff, maybe doing some banking. The key thing is you don't leave a social trace. You would leave a data trace, okay? Uh, and I think that's something we've got a little bit more um, cognizant of in recent years for obvious reasons. Um, so that's visitor mode. You're literally visiting something online and then sort of stepping away from it, not leaving a social trace. That's one end of the continuum. The other end of the continuum, resident mode, you're really thinking of the, of the web. And I think this is important. You're thinking of the web as a series of spaces or places. And the reason is because your motivation to uh, pay attention, uh, your motivation to be in those places is to be co-present with other people. You're connecting with other people. Okay. Now, whether that's for work or for study or purely social, it sort of doesn't necessarily matter. The, the, the point is that that there are other people involved and you're connecting with them or you're around them and you leave a social trace. So you're leaving a trace on the surface of the web, if you like, which can be connected with your identity. It doesn't have to be you. It could be an alt identity, but it's connected with an identity of a person. And that includes things like obviously being active in social media, joining in discussions, commenting on things, but it doesn't have to be about that end of the technology. Some people, as you know, would be very socially present in email. Uh, and so they are resident through email. Because if you think, where would I go to connect with that person? Sometimes the answer might be, well, email's their thing. So I'm going to email them. And that's where we'll kind of be resident together. OK, it's not about a particular type of technology. So I hope that's reasonably clear as an idea. Uh, you might have seen the video that I made a, a, a few years ago. In the middle of the continuum, I think is a really important area, which is where people are resident, but within a known network or community. You could argue that that's what we're doing here. There's kind of edges to it. Um, so some of what we do online, like I tweet, is just out there. Anybody can look at that. They don't even have to be a member of Twitter. Um, but a lot of what we do, for example, when we're teaching students online, a lot of what we do around education online is within a kind of closed group or community. So a lot of activity happens there. I think most of what happens on the web is somewhere in, in, that, in that kind of zone. And that's quite important. You know, when, when Web 2.0 came out and social media came out, people sort of felt like the whole of the web was just narcissists making friends with people who they didn't really know. But what was actually happening was that was the only bit of the web that you could see. But obviously there's an enormous amount going on that's happening effectively behind closed doors, but it's still resident. Then what we did was we added a, a, a vertical axis because context is incredibly important. And certainly when we came up with this, there was a lot of um, higher education institutions coming up with social media like things and then wondering why none of the students joined in. And the reason is context. You know, what we do in a personal context is different from what we do in an institutional context. So what that allows us to do, this is this is a map of mine. I'm sure it's shifted around since I made this. But you can, you can take the kind of places or the tools that you use online and you can map them against that grid. So, you know, I'm, I'm actually a lot less resident in Twitter than I used to be over the pandemic. I think I sort of became exhausted by being online. So I'm much less resident in Twitter than I used to be. Uh, but I tend to tweet about work more than personal stuff. And so that's resident institutional. It's definitely connected to me. It definitely leaves a social trace. I blog. That's definitely about work, but it's connected to me. It's my opinions. It's my thoughts. Perhaps at the other end of the map, you know, I've got, I've got a Gmail account, but I only really use it for admin. I'm not chatting away to people in there. That's how I choose to use it. Facebook, which I use like a really bad address book, but I don't really contribute at all. I'm also the member. I'm a member of a running club and they run through Facebook. So I tend to go there for information, but I'll very, very rarely contribute like I'm like like stealth social media visitor social media 
And then quite often things end up in the middle. You know, I put Google Docs, but really that's that whole range of Google services where it's just a chaotic mix of personal and professional and everything just in a great big bucket. And it just ends up right in the middle there. Some of the stuff shared with other people, some of it's just mine. Okay. So that's my map. Um, yours will look a bit different. Uh, what I'm going to ask you to do now is go to this Padlet. I made a, I made a short URL of it, but that doesn't help uh, your because I didn't share it with you. So if you can copy and paste the, uh, the URL, there it is. It's in the chat, uh, so it leads us to the same. Yeah. So what we're going to do? What time is it? Yeah, we've got we've got um, time for for the next sort of, sort of seven minutes or so, which is actually quite a long time. So don't feel like you have to rush. If you draw your map along the lines I described, I mean, I'm I'm literally talking. You can go like this and then start drawing squares. You know, it doesn't have to be anything particularly elegant. In fact, and you won't get it right first time. It's supposed to be a kind of relatively kind of quick and dirty process. Draw your map either on paper or digitally. Hit the Padlet link and then upload your map, and then we'll have a bit of a discussion about them. Okay. Um, just drop us a line in text chat if you if you, if none of that makes any sense or if you get stuck. But other than that, I'm going to let you kind of get on with doing your own map. And while you're doing it, I'm going to go back to. Um, wait, that's not going back. That's going forwards. That's going back. I'm going. I'm going to go back to my map. Please don't copy my map. I'm just putting it there as for reference. I mean, if you literally copied and pasted it and uploaded it as your own. That would be pretty audacious, audacious piece of plagiarizing, and I'd almost respect you for it. But it's just there to help out. <laughs> uh, and in a few moments, what I'll do is wander over to the Padlet and share that in here. Yeah, people find already connecting to the Padlet, it seems to be working, but Great. we don't give some more time for drawing. You know what, I'm going to look at the Padlet. I'm going to, I'm going to just check in on the Padlet via my phone because I just cannot cope with only having one screen. So this is my <laughs> second screen for now. That's good. Oh, there's the... Yeah, great, Elizabeth, Isabel, that you're... Uh, thanks around. as well. Yeah. Just just for note, when you go into the pad bit, Isabel's visiting resident map is very neat and pretty to look at. Please don't feel daunted by that. <laughs> but we'll have a chat about it in a second, Isabel, if, if, if you're around. I stupidly watched the video, the wrong webinar recording. So I watched this webinar last week. <laughs> thinking that I'd missed it somehow. So it's lovely to be part of the live discussion. It's like, well, no, I'm glad that you, I'm glad that it worked because that's a, that's an interesting looking map, but uh, you know, that's like some sort of super flipped approach to learning. So um, the easiest way to do this is actually to use your phone. And um, that's where the short link is handy. You literally take a, fo a photo of it on your phone, go to the Padlet, and then upload it into the Padlet from your phone. It's a little bit fiddly. Depending on your smartphone, if you have the Zoom app installed, you can now these days um switch between computer and the uh, smartphone uh, pretty handy uh, pretty smoothly but um 
Now there's different. Put that up. I'll put I'll put that up on screen for a bit if you feel if if you need to sort of hand type it in. Yeah, there's lots of different ways of of, of doing it, um, and really don't feel the need. You know, we're not really up against it time wise. Um, and the other thing is, if you feel like you want to spend more time on your map, and you can always re-upload it. And if you don't get a chance to upload it during the session, then it is worth uploading it because the Padlet becomes a bit of a record for the course as well. So there's some things coming in here. So I'm just going to switch to the Padlet on my sharing. Um, that is not what I expect to see at this point. Let's try that again. Did you connect your mobile phone to your computer? No, it's just, it's not. Ah, no, I know what's happening. That is why I expected to see. I'm just not seeing the same version as everybody else. So somewhere in here. Mm -hmm. This, does that have a red line around? Ah, yes. Wow. This Definitely screen's... Padlet's uh, coming in and Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It was, it was, so you can see Padlet through Zoom, yeah? And we see uh, the Padlet through Zoom now, yeah. Yeah, brilliant. Is there any way to use the camera to take a photo of it? Because I don't have Zoom on my phone yet. Yes, take the take a photo with your camera, and then you could um, go to. And, I'll try, Dave, but um, I have to do it from Zoom somehow, I guess. No, no, you, you just go, you can, um, on your phone then, when you took a photo, uh, you go to this um, tiny URL link. It's probably the easiest. Um, Dave, no, I just meant if I could do it with my laptop camera because I don't have Zoom on my phone, but maybe I can just use the web, like the web version without... If you go directly to Padlet on your phone. Oh, okay. Okay. And then chuck the picture in just from your gallery on your phone. Oh, okay, so it works with a link. Uh, yeah, you, should, you can go. You don't have. You don't have to go via Zoom. Great. I mean, I think one of the hardest things is passing links around these days and not ending up in some kind of weird dead end. <laughs> Here's the link yeah, again, but uh, if you connect from your mobile phone directly to the Padlet, the, the link uh, Dave provided was easier. It leads you to the same Padlet. Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Dave, was a tiny URL? Let me have a look. I'm going to copy and paste it into the yeah. chat. Just so that people can see it. Should get you there. Uh, one possibility is to uh, click the share in the Padlet if you are on your browser, on your computer, and then, um, what would it be in English? Uh, there's and then a send it to, yeah, QR that's code. what I was thinking. QR code. You can load it and use it on your mo mobile phone. Yeah, I'll send uh, it to myself. Yeah, that's yeah. a good idea. I think during the pandemic is the first time QR codes became meaningful for me. <laughs> <laughs> Just as a way of not putting typos into URLs <laughs> and also for ordering beer. So, you know, finally the QR code. Elaborate on that, uh, David. How do you order beers well, with QR codes? Well, in the UK during various lockdowns, you, you could sit outside of a pub and there'd usually be a little <laughs> QR code on the glued to the table and it would say, scan this and order through this app. And you ah. do that. And you'd be pretty unconvinced, but then somebody would bring you a beer and you drink it. So it seemed fine. <laughs> <laughs> I'll just give this a couple more minutes. As I say, do 
do continue to upload your maps while we chat, but I want to leave time for discussion. It's fantastic to see these coming in. Um, and I think it's always not, I mean, just from a teaching and learning point of view, there's not, it's really nice when you get to see everybody's work side by side. It's a bit like the way you're kind of tiles in everybody's blog posts into that one page. I think students generally appreciate it because it gives a sense of presence through work. So as soon as you see a bunch of maps coming in, this, this, is my, this is my sort of response to it. When I see a bunch of maps coming in, I really feel like there's a bunch of, I'm with a bunch of people doing something and it feels really connected and I feel like I belong to something much more than just at the start where everybody's a sea of video faces. So there's not, you know, there's nothing like working on things together. I know this is quasi together, but I think, I, I think that that's one of the things that we really learned over the pandemic is the power of making work visible to increase a sense of presence and a sense of belonging. So in a way, you guys are being somewhat resident in Padlet. So what I'm going to do now, keep going. There's some interesting looking ones in there. I'm just going to pick, pretty much randomly pick a map. And then if you are the author of that map, and you're happy to have a little chat about it, then get on the mic and we'll have a little chat about it. And we'll just do that for a little bit. Now, I, I, you know, I, I don't really know what's in these maps. I'm gonna start with this one because it's in front of me. Now, if this is your map and you wanna say hi, then please jump on the mic. If you can't say hi, then that's fine. I will just give you sort of 10, 15 seconds to say hi on the microphone. And if you don't, then um, that's fine. Um, I think, yeah. oh, hi. Yeah, sorry, sorry. Um, I had too many windows open. <laughs> <laughs> That's how it goes. So tell us about your map. Is there anything in particular that you want to highlight there? I see that you're very resident in LinkedIn. I just actually, so basically um, I was very nervous about um, doing even Twitter. Until, until a couple of years ago when my colleagues actually said that it's really necessary now for professional reasons. And mm -hmm. um, once I started, I just, I think that it's just getting comfortable with it. So yeah. I, I think it's really by doing, you get more comfortable with it and you stop worrying about um, if I post this, what will happen and will it get misinterpreted, et cetera. Yeah, absolutely. So what you're, I think what we're saying there is residency is like experiential, isn't it? And I think mm. that that's what's interesting is you can't, so it would be relatively easy to describe to somebody how to use Twitter. You know, you type this in and you click this and you can retweet like that. But it's almost meaningless because it's an actual lived practice, isn't it? And so until you've actually done it, no amount of instruction manuals is really going to tell you what's happening. Uh, and, and I think that's, in, that's useful to know because actually a little bit like this course, the best way to learn a lot of these things on the resident end is to just do them. And so as educators, I'd say it's our job to kind of scaffold that doing uh, rather than to kind of theorize or you don't even need much of an instruction manual. No, that's really interesting. And you're, and you're a big deal in Instagram, are you personally or not? <laughs> yeah, I actually, um, after my Twitter, I discovered Instagram and uh, I've been finding it pretty interesting to use to, to, to share things with friends when other countries and even former students that become my friends and yeah. yeah 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 that's interesting yeah okay thank you for that i'm gonna i'm gonna go to a to another map there's loads in here now um let's have a look because i think what's what what's interesting to me is that, that I, don't, I don't know if it's just because I showed my map, but I think it might just reflect the nature of the internet now is that a lot of the maps have very similar key elements on them. Now I do like colors. Who's, whose is this? Um, and you've got Moodle in there, you see. So there's a virtual learning environment. And Netflix, you've remembered to put Netflix in. A lot of people forget that Netflix is on the internet. Yeah. <laughs> Who, who's yeah. this? Hi. Hi it's Megan. mine, hi. So I see you've got Moodle and Teams in there. And it seems to me that if that's resident, then, and I don't know how much this was driven by the pandemic, but it would seem that, you, that in, in your job, you're quite resident. Is that fair? 
Yeah, so we do, all of our courses are delivered 100% online. So wow. Moodle, we have to be resident in Moodle and then we use Teams because it's um, because yeah. it's linked to SharePoint, it's much easier to mm -hmm. navigate than trying to navigate SharePoint. So that's how we Everything's easier than navigating <laughs> SharePoint, isn't it? There's nothing that isn't <laughs> easier than navigating SharePoint. Uh, probably yeah. the Hampton Court maze is simpler. But anyway, yeah, <laughs> that makes sense. And and you're and I'm guessing your WhatsApp is pretty chaotic and busy with stuff happening all, yeah. the time all over the place. How do you feel about that? Yeah, I actually hate WhatsApp, but um, <laughs> Just, I think because it's so busy, but it's like you run work through that. And then like, I, don't, I don't know, I've got two kids. So every school group is on that and it's yeah. every, yeah. just busy. <laughs> yeah. It's interesting, isn't it? Because it wasn't that long ago that people were really, really compartmentalizing work and life and the various portions of their life. And I think that's just all collapsed. I think the pandemic has finally put pay to that. And really, there's just kind of a bit of everything happening almost everywhere. It makes places mm. like Moodle seem like quite relaxing these days because at least you know that's only work, right? But yeah. I think, so I think, you know, we used to talk about compartmentalized approaches to online engagement and decompartmentalized approaches. Um, and I think, no, that's the other way around with the hand gesture. I think everybody's become much more decompartmentalized and your WhatsApp would be an example of, of, of that. And, mm. and maybe after the pandemic, we've got to start picking these things back apart again. I don't know. Okay, I'm gonna. I'm just gonna look at um, one more, just for discussion. As I say, this is this is just a, me like randomly picking things. Um, I'm gonna go for a, a digital one. Whose is that? Because I'd say what jumps out of me. Uh, what jumps out of me? That was an interesting bit of grammar. Um, what jumps out for me is that Twitter's institutional there, which, um, and distinctly institutional, which means I, I'm gonna take a guess that this person might run a sort of departmental Twitter feed or something like that. Um, but if you're not around or you can't get on the mic or you don't want to, then that's absolutely fine. What I think what you can see here just from the maps I've gone through is there is a bit of a pattern emerging and there are key things. This one is, is, has got Google search on it, which is also interesting because a lot of people don't put search on because we're so normalized to it, we sort of forget it's there. But actually, and it's, and it's, it, it's important to remember that Google search doesn't contain anything, it leads to other things. Uh, but nevertheless, we end up starting there an awful lot of the time. Um, and what I'm going to do is just to finish this section, I'm just going to have a look at Isabel's. So Isabel, I don't know if you wanted to say anything about that. Uh, I think you, you probably had a bit more time to reflect than this kind of high speed workshop. But I think what's interesting is this kind of, um, I want to say Mondrian, but it's, it's definitely a kind of cubist layering there. Uh, is the way that everything's kind of stacked on top of each other in a great big pile and, and that those modes sort of cross over. Is there anything you wanted to say about this? Um, for me, uh, the last couple of years have been um, quite a change because I've made a distinct, um, what do you call it, a strategic decision to move away from using technology all the time and to be less attached to my screens because mm -hmm. for work it's completely a screen-based job so um as you can see i do a lot of work in um online spaces have you know for academic research for zoom for meetings for creating stuff for teaching courses um so then your whole world gets consumed by technology. And um, I think then trying to cut that down, and I know that there's this, this fake distinction between private and public use, but um, I think there's something to be said for wanting to be less involved in digital and more involved in people um, and meeting people and building relationships in real time. Um, rather than just doing it through, through a screen. Um, yep. So that's what, that's what this, for me, has symbolized that, that I'm actually getting to a place where I can move away from screens. 
Yeah, and, and it's interesting that you have to do that consciously now. So like if you take your hands off that wheel, the default is you find it that the whole of your life is looking at a screen. It's like you have to actively move away from screens. This is what I think of as a cultural flip, you know, where, the, where something cultural is turned upside down. And I, I, I've started saying at my institution that, that, uh, that all, all courses are online courses, some of which include some things happening in buildings occasionally, right? So I'm just turning the whole thing upside down. My, my proposal would be the, the way to, to design a really good course is to design it as a fully online course and then plan in face-to-face -face in building sessions into that design rather than going the other way around. And I'm wondering if the pandemic has sort of brought us there because I've talked to a few academics about that idea and they've gone, oh yeah, no, that sort of makes sense. Whereas pre-pandemic, they'd have gone, no, I don't think so. I think we're a face-to-face -face institution. Because the thing about my proposal there is I'm not saying how much online and how much face-to-face -face there is. I'm just talking about a design principle. It could, it could be still 80% face-to-face on that basis, right? But essentially there's either co-presence synchronous events and either they're online or face-to-face -face. and then there's asynchronous and looking at resources so once we get i think what i'm trying to say is the divide between the digital and the physical isn't as big a deal as it used to be there are much more important dividing factors in education to do with access to do with which language you have as a first language or as additional language to do with your cultural background to get, to do with your previous education these are much bigger things to consider than whether you happen to be doing your teaching session online or face to face outside of like material practices um anyway there's a bit of a big play thank you isabel uh i i think um you know, you, you wrote a great blog post as well, which I'll, I'll, I'll just mention in passing on, on the way through. What I'm going to do, thank you for engaging. That that Padlet's there for you to have a look around. It's really interesting seeing each other's um, business and resident maps. And when, we, and when we do this in a longer session, <clears throat> or if we're in the same physical room, then usually we'd have a cup of tea and everybody walk around and talk to each other about their maps, which is quite a nice part of the process. Uh, so part of what we learn is from kind of each other's maps. Okay, another, another little reshare here. What I'm going to do is just sort of um, reflect on, well, not reflect on that. I'm going to go to, I would do, but I'm getting so many Teams notifications. I can't actually get at the button that I want to. The bottom right-hand corner of my screen is very busy and often a notification comes up before I can press the thing. It's just a poor design. Anyway, so I'm just going to sort of get, we had a discussion, so that's nice. So I'm just going to theorize a little bit and then, uh, talk a little bit about what you can do with that process and maybe maybe how it's helpful beyond what we've done. Um, you know, I think we're used to traditional education, historical education was normally quite hierarchical in terms of power, in terms of the way that you moved through it, in terms of it being in the physical environment, you know, what you physically had access to. I think now we're, now we're in a world which is um, networked in, in practice, but often what's happening is there's this tension between hierarchical modes of working, like most of our institutions are hierarchical, and the fact that they're doing most of their work in network spaces. You might have found this at your own institution is that actually what happens is that an institution goes online and then spends its whole time trying to not operate in a networked manner, but trying to place a hierarchy, you know, trying to hierarchize the network, if you like, which is what's great about this course, because this course is, is fundamentally really networked. Um, and, and I think that networked approach, uh, I just had a look around some of your blog posts. Uh, I think that networked approach can sometimes, if, if you, when you encounter it, it can sometimes feel a little bit strange and it can feel like you're just being sort of floating in there and you're not quite sure what's going on because it might not have strict kind of linear forms of progression or things to do. But I think this is where really, really good learning happens, definitely at higher education, but at all sorts of levels. I'd also say, in primary school when you're like four or five, an awful lot of your learning is in this, in this mode. Play is in this mode, right? So you could argue that, you know, if you bring the philosophy of play to the network, it tends to work really well. Isabel had gaming on her map, for example. Um, and in the, in it, 
from a sort of theory point of view, you could you could say, well, constructivism, and you know, you can have a look at the Wikipedia's on these. I'm not going to go into them in great detail. It may or may not be useful for you to look at a bit of theory. Constructivism is a kind of hierarchical theory. Connectivism, which I'm sure you'll get onto, or I mean, you're just built this on a connectivist connectivist basis for sure. Uh, connectivist is the kind it kind of theorizes the the how, what, how we can actually make the most of, of being in a networked environment, really. It's a kind of learning theory for the networked environment. Some people would argue that it's, that it's kind of um, an extension of previous theories, but I think it's useful. This is Isabel's blog post. You can find it in the stack of blog posts where she elucidates on her map, which I think is, is worth taking a look at as, as well. Um, so just very quickly, you know, in terms of reflecting on the mapping process and the value of it, perhaps. This is the first, this, these are the maps from the first mapping workshop I ever did, which was with people from libraries. And I, I, I highlighted where Facebook was on each of them. And you can see it's in different places. And I guess the point that I'd make is that the, the technology does not mandate the mode of engagement. It might uh, have certain affordances that encourage a certain mode of engagement. So obviously, you know, Instagram, social media is going to aggressively try and make you socially visible and connect. But like I said, I use Facebook like a terrible address book. So asking somebody what platforms they use doesn't tell you about what their practices are. You have to ask them more questions than that. Um, this is one of my favorite maps, two emails. I think what this highlights for me is that the busyness of your map does not relate to how successful you are with what you're trying to achieve or not. So having stuff all over your map is not necessarily the goal. I think the goal for me is having agency. It's a bit, it's a bit like what Isabel was saying about uh, choosing to step away from the screen. The question is, are you being pushed around by the technology by Silicon Valley, or are you uh, making choices that you feel like you have control over? It's to do with uh, I don't know, you know, Zuboff's uh, Surveillance Capitalism is a really good book on this. And I think it's important for our students to kind of regain a sense of agency over what they do or don't engage with and on what basis. Um, sometimes you get more visitor maps. Sometimes you get people that have split it by color because they're two different, like that this was, they had like a personal identity online and, and, a, and a professional one. I'm just going to flip through some of these because I, I don't have time to talk about them, but I really made the point. And then the other thing that we did with the mapping, this is in a paper that's in First Monday. I wish I could remember what it was called, but I'm sure if you type visitor and residence into Google Scholar, it comes up. And we did the mapping process with about 380 students across 18 different institutions. And then I, I basically went through them and defined whether they were all the quadrants were filled or just some of the quadrants were filled and, and then did a bunch of maths on that. The key point here, if you look down in the bottom left, is that um, the people who had like, were all over their map, if you like, very, very engaged in lots of different modes, that this, once you normalize the data, that split completely evenly across age groups, somewhat demonstrating that the native is an immigrant and a kind of generational approach doesn't make any sense. So I was very happy when I saw that. Um, you can annotate your maps. Uh, to explain your kind of motivation, how you feel about areas of your map. Uh, somebody's done a consumer creator thing here. I'll skip that one. Direction of travel. I think that's interesting. You know, when if you're becoming more or less resident. So for Twitter, for me, it's heading towards visitor um, because my boss and my boss's boss follow me and my mum. So I can't say anything in Twitter now. Arrows, I think is interesting. You know, how, do, how, how does how do things flow between the, the different, um, the different uh, platforms, the different spaces or tools. Um, so for me, I'd tweet and then maybe I'd blog and then maybe I'd make a video. And then this one, this was a bit of everything. <laughs> and then this one I, I like is kind of aspirational or hypothetical. That pink area on the right is, is imagined. It's like, this is where I want to head because I want to become this sort of person. And this, this person wanted to become a really good digital scholar. They wanted to be really visible out there online. How are we doing for time? Right, I'm gonna hammer ahead. Just, I think the, t the concept of presence is something that I blogged about um, last year. And for me, I think, you know, residency is based on presence. 
And I think one of the things that we found over the pandemic is how important various modes of presence are to us. And my, my view now is if you want to design really good online learning, you start with how can I maximize different forms of presence and work from there. Um, i.e. you don't focus on content you focus on presence you can be present through content just like you guys were through your maps but nevertheless I, I you know when our buildings were like co-presence machines and when we lost them we really felt it so we piled into zoom because it looked a little bit like a building because you could see everybody's faces but it didn't feel quite right there are lots of different ways of facilitating modes of presence online. And I think we've got to use all of them in different combinations rather than just trying to look at people's faces because we know that doesn't really work. And just to finish up, um, this is the kind of book, the other bookend to the Kevin Kelly quote at the start. So Kevin Kelly said, everything's connected to everything else. This is the kind of more kind of pedagogic or epistemological version of that, which is that, now that this abundancy of connections and abundancy of information and abundancy of networks, social or otherwise, instead of us as educators uh, having the job of moving knowledge around, we're actually the arbiter of connections. We're there to facilitate connections, whether those connections be between people, between ideas, between institutions, and you know that's exact, and, and I'd say that's exactly what you're doing here. You're 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 you're, you're saying how, how how do I make things as connected as possible, on the basis that the more the more connections there are, you know, good things happen. Uh, and I'll finish there. Thank you very much for taking part um, and hanging on in there with the mapping process, and we're getting things into Padlet. Really appreciate it. Thanks so much, Dave. Uh, highly appreciate the great meta reflections on the on our course design, and it's not uh, I cannot take much credit for it. It's uh, Lars Solin and uh, and Chris Niranzi who started this before, and all the other organizers before. Um, but um, there there are a few questions in the chat, uh, Dave. Okay, yeah, sense. let's take a, let's, yeah, let's take maybe starting with Elizabeth Corell who started like um, a few. The fifth post. yeah i do uh, i mean i have to go pretty prompt because i gotta go yeah. to another meeting yeah like of everybody. course but let's course. What, what have you what, what, what the question was um like uh, um she agrees with you on how to think of course planning with digital online and what you were saying everything oh, yeah. is online course but then uh, um saying that uh, um, highly motivated students can deal with more digital distance learning while less motivated or goal-oriented students depend more on physical meetings would you agree yeah i think so i think it's because it's there's like the psychology of getting up and going out the house and going and doing a thing in inverted commas and i see that with my own kids to be fair you know um it I, and that's why i think quite often in higher education fully online distance works better at postgrad than it does at undergrad perhaps um but i'd also argue that good pedagogy contains the, those motivating factors you know, um, and it, it's kind of our job of it, uh, 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 as educators to um, provide, to encourage the students to develop intrinsic motivation. I don't know if that makes any sense, but that's how I see it. Yeah, should, should we take I think, one? Yeah, I think it does. Uh, do you have time for one more minute? Yeah, well, uh, one great. more question. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then uh, Chia saying her experience that students uh, fear online approaches and demand in-person contacts, even when their online experience based on feedback, feedback are relative positives. How do we convince them? How do we convince institutional decision makers also to resist student pressures demands? Hmm. Well, that's a huge thing. Well, I, I mean, what I'd say is we need to remember that education is both a, a cognitive intellectual pursuit and a cultural pursuit. And so what I think I'm seeing is that students want to, want to engage with their cultural idea of university, which involves going into, into buildings and sitting in lecture halls. And that is distinct from whether they think that that's good for learning or not. They wanna do university as a cultural experience. Fair enough, they wanna come and party, they wanna hang around rude places, they wanna meet people, et cetera, et cetera. So my, my answer would be to be aware of that and split those two things out. Personally, I think a near future for, for higher education is to have really huge, super social communal events 
every so often in the building and then to put most of the stuff that's actually good for learning online and just to split it out that way. Um, but that, I mean, I think that's a huge thing that we're going into now. We've got to figure that out. So that's my view on it. Um, but I, I just think it's sometimes useful to remember that um, students come into education to become and to ex experience a certain life, which has nothing to do with whether the learning's effective <laughs> or not. No, true. And, and, and like I totally with you on saying like we have to revisit blended learning now these days, so I guess, yeah. Uh, yeah. and yeah. They do blended learning revisit it now that everyone has some experience by it. Uh, great kickoff for the topic, uh, Dave. Um, Cheers, everyone. Starting us reflecting on our uh, digital practices and uh, that's still relevant uh, post pandemic as well. So thanks so much. Uh, yeah. Have fun, everyone. And Cheers. Um, I've got to run, but thanks, yes. guys. Cheers. See you. And uh, 